Hey everyone, this is Jace with Elevate Strategies here to help you conquer the NPTE. Today we're going to go through a practice question and it is a non-systems question from our equipment, devices, and technology category. And today we're going to talk about uh, prosthetics and gait deviations. So let's read our question and answers first. A patient with a left transfemoral amputation is learning to ambulate on a new prosthetic device. During ambulation, the patient demonstrates an increased lumbar lordosis that is especially exaggerated during the stance phase. The most likely cause of this problem is A, an extension contracture at the hip, B, poor lumbar extensor muscle contraction, C, insufficient socket flexion, D, the prosthetic is too tight. So if we look at our question, we see that we have a gait problem and that we need to state the cause of the problem. So let's pull out some information that we need from the question. We have a left transfemoral amputation and the deviation is that there's an excessive lumbar lordosis and this occurs mainly during the stance phase of gait. So let's look at our answers and let's try to do a process of elimination with this particular question. But first we have to know what a lumbar lordosis is. And that simply means an exaggerated curve in the lumbar spine into extension. So if we look at our first answer, we see that it says an extension contracture at the hip. So if our hip is stuck in extension, what happens to our lumbar spine? Well, usually it also goes into extension. We will get an excessive curvature in our back when we have hip extension but we have to remember all the information we pulled from our question. So yes, the hip extension lines up with our lumbar lordosis, which was our gait deviation, but we also read that the deviation occurs more during the stance phase. So if we think about the definition of a contracture, that means we have a permanent shortening of the muscle. So the hip will be in extension throughout the entire gait cycle and stuck in extension. So although that could lead to some lumbar lordosis, we gotta be careful about using all the information from our question. And since the question gives us kind of specifically a stance phase deviation, we might wanna put a pin in this answer. Not quite sure if it will completely fit the entire question. Because if we have a hip contracture, we're gonna have hip extension through the entire gait cycle and not just in the stance phase. So our second answer says poor lumbar extensor muscle contraction. So if we have excessive lumbar lordosis, we're more likely to have a tight lumbar extensor musculature. Um, either way, there's probably not any weakness in the lumbar extensors if we're in excessive lumbar extension. So this answer doesn't really make sense. So let's just go ahead and eliminate this answer. So our third answer says insufficient socket flexion. So if we think about insufficient flexion, we see that we have a sagittal plane problem in the answer because flexion occurs in the sagittal plane. And if we think about lumbar lordosis, this also occurs in the sagittal plane. A lot of times, some of the gait deviations that we see will actually match up with the plane of the problem. Let's take a quick tangent to illustrate this point. So for example, if we have someone with a transtibial amputation that demonstrates knee valgus in the stance phase, we can say that knee valgus is a frontal plane dysfunction, right? Like it occurs in the frontal plane. We've got the knee kind of going medially. So as such, we're more likely to have a frontal plane problem than anything else. So if we had a question asking us the cause of knee valgus in a patient with a transtibial prosthetic, and we have some answer choices that might include the socket is set too far medially, or the ankle joint is set too much in plantar flexion, we already kind of have a lead uh, for this question because if the set socket is set too far medially, that is a frontal plane deviation. Uh, we had valgus, which is medial, and we had the socket is set too far medial. So all of those are in the frontal plane. It wouldn't make sense to say the ankle joint is set in too much plantar flexion because that's likely to affect uh, some flexion at the knee, some extension at the knee, or some flexion extension at the ankle. So we can dive further into each of these answers and talk about why the so socket is set too far medially, 
um, and why that produces knee valgus specifically, if that doesn't quite make sense yet. But really the point of this tangent that we're taking is just to explain to you that a quick way on the NPTE, if you just have a question about gait deviation and prosthetics, is to see, does any of the answers line up on a rational level? Does any of the answers line up with the plane of deviation? And if so, that might be a little bit of a clue. So you can start with that approach, but then you're gonna have to continue to think through the rest of the question, but at least it gives us somewhere to start. So that's kind of the whole point of this tangent. So let's go back to our question. We already somewhat like uh, the third answer because it aligns with the plane of our gate deviation. But if we only use that rationale, then answers one and two work as well. So let's continue thinking about answer C. What happens if we can't flex our hip during gait, especially during the stance phase? Well, throughout gait, the hip has to be able to do both flexion and extension. So if the hip can't flex because we have insufficient socket flexion, then the body will have to compensate somehow. So if we think about our pelvic tilting or even our lower crossed syndrome, if you know what that is, an anterior pelvic tilt is associated with hip flexion and or tightness of the hip flexors. It's also associated with lumbar lordosis and extension of the lumbar spine. Whereas a posterior pelvic tilt is associated with hip extension or tightness of the hip extenders and flexion of the lumbar spine. Since we have lumbar lordosis in our question, that would cause an anterior pelvic tilt, which would essentially make up for a lack of hip flexion from the insufficient socket flexion. So it's another way for us to gain some sort of hip flexion, but we just do it indirectly through the spine instead. So we sort of have a match in our answer and in the question here. So now we've kind of got two reasons that we like C. So first it matches with the plane of deviation that we talked about, but also it's reasonable that we'd see excessive lordosis to make up for a lack of hip flexion or socket flexion. All right, but we need to look at the last answer and that is that the prosthetic is too tight. So in this case, there really isn't a plane of motion that like we just talked about, because it's not exactly a motion deficit. This is more of like a fitting deficit. So if the prosthetic were too tight, it would probably be uncomfortable for the patient, but it wouldn't really necessarily cause a motion deficit or a specific motion deficit. So again, this answer, it doesn't make much sense either. So let's just go ahead and eliminate that one. So if we think about our question overall, we've eliminated answers B and D because they didn't make any sense. So we're left with answers A and C. But we talked in the beginning that we had a little bit of problem with answer A because that hip contracture just tells us that something's wrong with the hip through the whole cycle. So it doesn't quite fit the question and it especially doesn't fit the question as well as our answer C. So as you probably surmise, the correct answer is C. But hopefully there were a few tidbits in today's question that might help you think through things on the test. So we found out we can definitely use a process of elimination. You've probably heard that before. You probably already do it, but it's one way to answer a question. We could use some rationalization to hone in on one answer versus another such as if the gate deviation is in one plane and the answer is in the same plane, that might make sense. We're just kind of rationalizing. And we can use specific information that's pulled from our question to really make the hard decisions. Answer A and answer C both seemed viable options. But as we previously talked about, answer C is the best answer over answer A. So to sum up, uh, there's a few reasons why a patient with a transfemoral prosthetic would demonstrate an excessive lumbar lordosis in stance phase. And we have some bullets here as to why that might happen. Uh, this is simply taken from Physiopedia. You can look at the resource if you'd like to go ahead and see extra information for yourself. But as you read through these, just make sure that each one makes sense in your head as to why that would cause an excessive lumbar lordosis.
All right, well, that's it for today. So thanks for joining us. Check out the information below. There are some links to our website and our email address if you have any comments or questions. And we'll see you next time.